Okay. Well, it's a great place. You know, when I wrote the uh, book on jobs, there's, as you may have noticed, a sentence or two about you in it. I mean, you play a role in it. But the sentence or two I struggled with was how to describe Stuart Brand. And I finally said he was one of the coolest people with brilliant ideas over multiple decades, giving us great joy. And uh, it starts with the mother of all demonstrations when, in the 60s, you helped create the computer rev revolution with Douglas Engelbart, and then the Whole Earth Catalog, which is the confluence of technology and sort of the counterculture, which defines the 70s. And in each decade, Stuart Brand, who is one of my heroes, has helped define our sensibility. You're now doing it uh, by helping us have a sensibility that goes into the future, the notion of the clock of the long now, uh, the many things you're doing in that regard. If you go look at uh, Stewart's website, instead of saying something like 2012, it says 02012, to, remember, to make us remember that uh, 10,000 years, we're still going to have to know about dates and places. And Ryan Phelan, of course, is uh, both in the profit and nonprofit world dealing uh, with uh, DNA and uh, what it can do uh, for us in the environment, but most specifically restoring species or reviving species that have been made extinct. So let me start with you, Ryan, and say, why do that? I think, I think because we can is the answer. Um, and I, I think that uh, really the whole concept of bringing back an animal or uh, in a species that has gone extinct is something that was so unthinkable. And as we have all grown up believing extinction is forever, and I think with the way that the science is moving so quickly, the notion that actually that may not be true is something worth wrestling with. And I think that's really why Stuart and I have, have started really just a, an exploration in thinking, in actually rethinking extinction. And that's highly controversial. You know, what does it mean, what does it mean to actually uh, question that premise? Is it a good thing for society? to question that premise. You know, what's the downside of rethinking extinction? Um, and I think that's what's so exciting about it. Uh, Stuart, how does it tie into your overall philosophy of taking the long view? Well, uh, <laughs> the reason that uh, Ryan and I were chortling away with Ed Wilson here is we basically worked together several years ago and Ryan ran an operation called All Species, which was intending to identify all the species in the world and catalog all the known species. And we worked with Ed on what became Encyclopedia of Life. So Ryan's work led directly into what you now see online at eol.com or .org, I guess it is. My own background is as an ecologist. Well, I was trained in ecology. I was a biologist in the 50s at Stanford. And uh, molecular biology was just coming on. I couldn't handle that, so I went toward ecology because you got to be a naturalist. You got to be around people like Ed Wilson and pay attention to biogeographical uh, understandings and good stuff like that. But in the course of more recent events, um, I wound up doing this book called Whole Earth Discipline. And in the process of doing Whole Earth Discipline, I realized that my fellow environmentalists had stopped being part of the solution and we're becoming part of the problem in a couple of specific areas. Uh, the, the one that, that upset me the most was that biotechnology, what had become of that molecular biology that I turned my back on in the 50s, was becoming the most powerful tool by far, technically, that uh, as Greens we could embrace, uh, attack almost every single problem that uh, had been resisting us everything from more efficient uh, energy to uh, reducing the horrible impact of agriculture on the landscape of the earth to, in fact, uh, dealing with endangered species at the genetic level and even uh, if this is the great moral issue that Ed was talking about, then the great moral issue is to prevent further extinctions, to maintain biodiversity, and if you can take that one step further with biotech and reverse extinction, that seems like a pretty obvious continuity. It's, uh, we're doing it within the Long Now Foundation, uh, an operation called Revive and Restore, uh, to encourage the scientists who are working all over the world, and we're now in cahoots with people like Jamie Shreve at 
National Geographic to uh, start bringing the various projects and the various techniques that are out there, cohere them, uh, help them work with each other, especially in terms of a, an ethical framework, and uh, start enriching ecosystems again, run extinction backwards. And I think, Walter, one other thing that's really important to say is that the technology is changing so rapidly and the cost of doing sequencing has gotten so in inexpensive. The, uh, the, the fact that grad students can be working on extinct species right now for a summer project and at the end of it will have sequenced, um, in fact, this summer, the morning dove, um, the band-tailed pigeon. Uh, you know, it's quite extraordinary to be able to do that. We couldn't have done that five years ago. And uh, God knows what we're gonna be able to do in another five. You know, Stuart, when you did the Whole Earth Catalog, you made the connection between the environment and technology as a good thing. You, you celebrated technology. Do you feel environmental movements have often been too afraid of technology? Yeah, in the 60s, <laughs> I mean, the, the whole Earth Catalog was sort of a counter counterculture thing because part of the hippie romantic notion was back to the land. and and away from the ivory tower, away from a certain intellectuality, away from uh, gross technological hammering of the earth and all of that. Um, and we went back to the land and tried to farm it and all, we all failed and, and went back to the city pretty quickly. So that was an important lesson. Uh, the ones who went into science did better than the ones who tried to live on communes forever. Personal computers were just coming along and space was just coming along in the 60s. And there was actually an aversion to personal computers. Um, Steve Jobs, who is the ultimate hippie, I mean, as we understand it, his last words were, oh, wow. Uh, said three times, it must have been amazing. So Steve was a late hippie, and he was one of the ones, perhaps influenced by Whole Earth Catalog and others, who realized that technology was a tool, not an enemy. And he was also, he came, when the space program was thought of as a problem by liberals and by environmentalists, no, we can't leave Earth until we clean it up. Uh, it's gonna be so expensive to go to the moon, let's use that money to clean up the Earth and then we deserve to leave the Earth. Uh, the only environmentalist at that time who said, no, let's get into space as soon as we can was Jacques Cousteau. And Jeek was saying, the only way we're gonna really find out what's going on with the oceans is, you know, it's very large, actually, and be able to watch it from above, then we can do it. And in fact, uh, the photograph of the Earth from space really set in motion the, the powerful coherence of the environmental movement in the late 60s and early 70s. You got friends of the Earth and all this th kind of thing emerging. Wait, real quickly, could you talk about your role in getting that photograph done? I get credit for something I did not do, which is uh, I did not take the photograph of the <laughs> Earth from space. <laughs> All I did is said, if when somebody does, it will be important. And they did, and so now I get the credit. That's cool. Wait, wait a second, Stuart. You asked for it, though. You did do a button. T tell about that. Well, I, you know, it was political action. hoop de doo I put on a hat with a feather under the sandwich board, and I stood around outside various universities, and the board said, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? And you know, other stuff happened, and pretty quickly there was the image, and then everything changed. Um, this keeps happening. There is a romantic strain in hippies. There is a romantic strain in the environmental movement, which is averse to technology. And every time we we reject technology, uh, either we make a dreadful mistake, uh, such as opposing genetically modified food crops, which I think are green basically top to bottom, and can be a hell of a lot greener, and will be. Uh, or we just deny ourselves a really fundamentally useful tool. And so, in a sense, I suppose working with a pasture pigeon and with various other things with biotech, I'm trying to do what I did with the whole of the catalog, is show how much fun it is to work with computers then, with space then, with biotech now. This stuff is green. Why the passenger pigeon, Ryan? Well, the passenger pigeon, how many people here actually recall the story of the passenger pigeon? Just curious. Great. It's iconic. It's, um, the passenger pigeon was the most populated bird in America. A hundred years ago, actually in 1913, 
was the, uh, the death of the, of the final passenger pigeon named Martha. And this passenger pigeon was a quite extraordinary bird. It was large, it was you know, you know, 12 inches long, quite beautiful. And it was in the billions. In fact, when you look back at which we have at, at some of the early history and the art paintings around it, they would say that the passenger pigeon darkened the sky. The flocks were a billion strong. They, they would take, in some cases, an hour or four hours for a flock to pass. Can you imagine? I mean, what, what must have that been like? Now, they were a very extraordinary bird, and I can tell you a lot more about that as well, how they bred and huge flocks and everything else, but it was just an amazing bird that was hunted to death, literally. Um, it was good to eat, and so it was uh, certainly fair game, but the problem was that because it was migratory and it would appear and disappear in different terrains based on the food crop on their chestnuts and uh, acorns, people didn't really get it that they were blasting the hell out of this bird. And so they would sort of assume, this is all before the internet 100 years ago, mind you, they would assume, well, all the birds are breeding somewhere else or they're passing through somewhere else. They didn't really believe that they were being hunted to death until it was too late. How do you do it? How would you bring it back? Well, um, technically, it, it would be referred to as you know, genetic re-engineering. The concept would be you would take the most closely related relative of the passenger pigeon, which happens to be the band-tailed pigeon, a quite common pigeon, um, and very closely related with the DNA. And so what you would do is you'd take that band-tail, and along with the sequencing that you got from the museum specimens of the old ancient passenger pigeons, as they refer to them, ancient DNA, you would actually line those up and trait by trait change the genome of the band-tailed pigeon until, as they say, if it walks and talks like a duck, it becomes a duck. Well, this would become a passenger pigeon. This is coming from uh, another Harvard gentleman named George Church, who Ryan, I didn't know until Ryan worked with him through DNA Direct, and, and uh, she's uh, on the board of his personal genome project. And George's genetic engineering was sort of gene by gene, and uh, George has been in the forefront of what is becoming genomic engineering has developed the techniques to, to do basically multiplex genome editing. So in a sense, what you're doing here is the same thing that really happens with hybridization or with sexual recombination, uh, which is that genes, uh, chromosomes, genomes that are similar through chromosomes that are similar uh, swap pieces of themselves. And that's pretty much normal in biology. What's fantastic with the technology that George is developing, and many others, but he happens to be in front of this, is the ability to write down to the level of a single base pair. Now, a passenger pigeon has 1.5 billion base pairs in its genome. We happen to have three billion base pairs in our genome. Down to the individual base pair, you can take a base pair from here and put it there. So you can take trait by trait, gene by gene, uh, sets of, of the genes from the passenger pigeon, swap them into band-tailed pigeon living genome, raise those birds with a number of traits. Might have the red eye of the passenger pigeon in a band-tailed pigeon, the peach-colored breast, the longer tail, um, a certain migratory impulse that the band-tailed pigeon does not have. Teasing out what are the really important genes, one of the really important traits, is part of the fundamental wonderful science that's going to go on here. One of the attractions of all this is as we develop this science, the whole science of protecting endangered species, of captive breeding, which itself is becoming increasingly genetic enterprise, genomic enterprise with frozen zoos and so on, all of this goes forward. Um, and it's interesting that you know, much of the complaint about biotechnology is, oh, it's, it's just, all it is is commercial, and Monsanto comes out and stuff like that. I think there's probably no commercial aspect to bringing back extinct species. Then why? Then why do it? Well, I think the most fundamental reason is uh, what we're going to learn from the science of understanding all that 
went on with, for example, even the passenger pigeon, of course, it may not have been all just the pressure of overhunting. It could have been all kinds of things that were going on with that bird that will be very helpful for other endangered species to know. So I think that, um, number one, it's, it, it's how much science is going to learn from a project like uh, all of these projects. And you'd like to bring back a whole lot more species, all of them? Well, and <laughs> absolutely. Dinosaurs? Um, no, so let me explain that really clearly, that uh, in order to do, to bring back a species today, you have to have today a closely related relative. And you actually ha also have to have yeah, the DNA. Yeah, but suppose uh, 50 years from now that's not necessary. Yeah, well, I, I that guess. That may well be the case. Yeah. You know, it, the, it, the one to watch would be the, the thylacine, the Tasmanian tigers. The you know, Australians mm -hmm. have a sense of humor. It's not a tiger, it's a marsupial wolf. Oh. The last one died in 1934, and they're not even sure how many chromosomes it had. Mm -hmm. But they have gotten to the point of taking some thylacine genes and bringing them to life, basically, to do that particular genetic thing in a mouse. Okay, okay that's pretty interesting. But there are no living species anything like the thylacine. So you can't do this technique that we just described with George Church's. Um, unless you can do way more, and maybe this is in 50 years time, um, basically typing out the probably two billion base pairs. Uh, Craig Venner did this recently with the right. East. Uh, and getting that to somehow go through the primordial, primordial germ cell and you know, into a blastocyst and becoming a functional egg that can be brought to term in something uh, which may or may not be an animal at that point. See, part of what's going on here is Moore's Law. Drove Steve Jobs' world, drives a lot of your interest, drives a lot of our interest. Basic doubling of the capacity of human of computers, of code, um, every year and a half. The curve is so much steeper in biotechnology that the capacity to read DNA or read genomes and write DNA is increasing on the order of eightfold to tenfold mm -hmm. per year. Mm -hmm. It's been doing that for a while. It shows signs that it's going to keep doing that for a while. So things like de-extincting species may be a semi-amateur medium mm -hmm. by the end of this decade. And, and, and I think it's you know, I would like to see some kind of framework of how we think about that before it goes totally amateur. I was just about to ask, exactly. what framework do we have morally to think about that before it goes amateur? Well, I think right now y what we have uh, been ferreting out is that there are a number of scientists all over the world working on projects related to de-extinction. So this is not us. This is out there. Um, whether it's a project in Australia to bring back, uh, whether it's uh, the moa or the Tasmanian tiger, you know, uh, in other areas are working on the woolly mammoth in Korea. Um, I mean, there are amazing projects underway. And I think for all of the scientists that we've spoken with to date, they actually talk about almost the moral, the moral reasons for t doing something like this. That if we have really brought these uh, species into extinction, do we as a society owe something to help them come back if we could? And whether or not they're actually rewilded and brought back into the population, I think is um, going to continue to be of great controversy. And part of what we're trying to do is help all of the, the individuals working in this area think through the moral issues. When should you bring it back? Under what conditions would you bring it back? What are the implications for invasive species that you, you know, are they an invasive species? when you bring them back 100 years later. Would they be? Well, that's a good you question. You know more than we do. It's a, it's a really good question. And in some cases, yes. On we hope end. they are. <laughs> Otherwise, they don't succeed. Invasive. Being that it succeeds. You know, invasive in pure ecology is a, is a neutral term. It just means successful. <laughs> uh, you know, this has been the stuff of uh, science fiction, I think, from the myth of Pr Prometheus to the movie Jurassic Park. And one of my favorites of this genre is Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein, about Dr. Frankenstein bringing something to life, putting the spark in it. And it's called, I think the subtitle of that book is The Modern Prometheus. And um, it doesn't turn out to be the world's greatest idea. 
what bad could happen of this? Could you end up like Dr. Frankenstein, uh, who I think at the end of the book, um, well, uh, was definitely not happy. Yeah, that's a search worth bringing out because there's so many things that, you know, your first cut at is it, well, God, you know, if you're playing God, th that's bad. Well, uh, we've been doing that for a while. We went through that with in vitro fertilization. Well, listen, you're playing God. If you're putting the egg and the sperm in a Petri dish together, you mustn't do that. And besides, there'll be something wrong with the baby. And it turned out there wasn't. And there were lots of really happy parents. And each one of these things, we go through certain... Mary Shelley, who was the most romantic of all writers of the 19th century, and it was, and you know, expressed this wonderful sort of myth of fear of technology, basically fear of scientists, fear of engineers, whatever that is. Uh, which it probably did, because you know, the, there is a lot of hubris loose in the world. Uh, Craig Vetter occasionally gets asked, uh, "Don't you think we're playing? You're playing God?" And Craig says, um, "We're not playing." <laughs> And when he was on the stage with Richard Dawkins, and uh, he basically said, and, and what's this about God? <laughs> <laughs> so look, all these issues come up. And it's early in the day. Uh, we are still finding out, is it actually really, truly possible to bring back a sufficiently real species that was extinct that is not just kind of a fraud um, can it actually make a home in the habitat where it used to live? This is not a given. Um, going from captive breeding, for example, to release in the wild is very difficult. And people who've been doing captive breeding with near extinct species for a while know how tricky that can be. One project that we've been watching very closely is the California condor. It was down to 22 birds at one point. Now they're back up to, thanks to captive breeding, 400. But one of the things they found out is that the chicks that were raised by parents who had originally been in the wild before they were captured and taken to the San Diego or the Los Angeles Zoo, their chicks did better in the wild than parents who had grown up in the zoo raising chicks. When those chicks were released to the wild, they had no idea. Uh, this is one of the reasons we like the passenger pigeon, because the passenger pigeon was the world's worst parent. Uh, they laid eggs in areas of you know, 12 square miles of nothing but birds, nothing but nests, nothing but eggs. They would all lay their egg in the same day. And then two weeks later, all of the parents, the squabs are you know, being fed uh, from uh, regurgitated food from their parents who are both being very dutiful until uh, day 14. And on that day, every single one of them leaves. Bye, good luck figuring out how to be a passenger pigeon. So it must have been genetic, yeah. which is good news. Uh, that suggests that this is actually one kind of bird that might get back into the wild very well. But in a sense, you're super domesticating these animals in order for them to do captive breeding to build up the population. And then you've got to have them be super undomesticated in order to go out and function in the wild and woolly wild. So all of these things getting sorted out is the, you know, the. I think the, uh, the work of decades, maybe centuries, uh, it's one of the reasons the Long Now Foundation is taking this on, is uh, people at the XPRIZE are saying, well, let's have an XPRIZE for the first uh, team to bring back an extinct species, and we're trying to say, please yeah. simmer down. Uh, you know, give this time. It is gonna take time to get it right. You go through, frankly, a Frankenstein period with every new technology. You have to do stuff wrong a bunch of times. One extinct species has already been brought back, the Bacarda, the Ibex from uh, the Pyrenees in Spain. Uh, the last one died in the year 2000. Three years later, they brought one back. How? Uh, that was a straightforward cloning thing. They had frozen uh, some ear cells from the last uh, an animal, which named Celia, a tree fell on her, and that was that. Uh, but they had frozen some tissue the frozen zoos of the world have tissues like this for, what, 8,000 species or something now. They took some of that tissue, which was what is called viable cells because it had been frozen the way it needs to be frozen, uh, did nuclear transfer into a goat egg, raised it in a goat, went through the process that they did with Dolly and all the other initial uh, efforts with cloning animals. Failure, 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 failure. 
and then they got a Bacarda that was born alive, was uh, completely intact. They did not have the thing which overwhelms the lung problems that new uh, animals raised this way sometimes have, and it died after seven minutes. Mm -hmm. But the answer to the question is, when will we bring back the first extinct species? The answer is, it already happened in 2003. Does the uh, technology of human cloning give you pause? paused a long time before answering that. <laughs> Ryan, you're closer to the human <laughs> genome. You, what's your trip on that? <laughs> Lots of pauses. Yeah, the I, pause I think a lot of pauses. Um, I, I guess I, I don't have a problem with reproductive technologies that um, are enhancing options for life in general. So that, that's what I'd have to say. But bringing back an ancestor by cloning her or him? I, I don't think that um, I would have a problem with the science. I would have a problem with the ethical way that it is done, the same way with another, with bringing back life from an extinct species, is that it has to be done in an ethical way. And, yeah. and I don't believe that, you know, everything is cloned. I mean, it, it's not 100%. You, you, you don't get the same thing because the environment is playing such an important role. There's, there's these things go through these stages, and, and the, I, I think you want to watch it stage by stage rather than worrisome endpoint by endpoint. So uh, I just read in Science or Nature the other day that the Newfield Council on Bioethics in Britain has given its okay to a technique now for heading off mitochondrial diseases, which are really serious. Um, where a woman who's uh, got some eggs is going to go through IVF, they determine that her eggs are going to be passing on a mitochondrial disease, happens with female and female, and, uh, but she would like to have healthy children. Well, it is now okay to take the nuclear DNA from her eggs, take another woman's egg which has healthy mitochondrial DNA, denucleate that other woman's mm -hmm. egg, put in the nucleus from the woman who doesn't want a diseased child into that egg, implant it back in mom, and she will now raise a child who is not going to have mitochondrial disease. But that's an easier one. Suppose somebody said to you, you're really cool, hmm. I want to clone you when you die. Would you say yes? Right now there's uh, laws against it. That's, you know, that, that's been talked about, and so far the answer is no. Um, I think that will be a situation where how do these things actually play out in the world? Um, amateurs push the edges and people are glad or not glad of the results. Remember, I was around when we were doing drugs. <laughs> Walter, I know you're, you're looking for the unintended consequences here and the kind of the dark side of this. And I think the question that keeps coming up is, you know, if you take the pressure off of extinction, you know, will, soci will society act in a, a, a less fearful way about protecting life? And is that fear base that we have about, my God, these are endangered species, mm -hmm. going to be lessened if you move the bar on extinction? And I think it's, a, it's an important question to wrestle with. But I think that, that you know, we, we have to think through it with society because uh, extinction is now probably not going to be forever, and there are going to be gradients of it. And so, you know, really thinking through it in a responsible way is imperative. Let me try a, a counter question on this. Suppose we were running out of San, out of Bushman. Bush out of Bushman. Bushman. Yeah. Yeah. And Bushman are, are an extraordinary kind of human being. Uh, they may be the, the, the earliest form of human being we have. Uh, they are genetically very, very similar to everybody else, but there are some serious dissimilarities which make them unique and quite wonderful. Um, as a people, they are in many respects endangered. You could imagine some set of disasters where you're down to just a few hundred San, and you, you probably, I think, would say, they would say, I predict, the San would say, we do not want to go extinct as a race or whatever you want to call it, a subset of humans. We want to be around. And others would say, you have every right to be around. And they would say, what is the technology that we have 
as humanity to be sure that there's always Bushmen among us. And that, that, that the extraordinarily deep gene genius that their genome has built all this time continues to remain available to humans in all biota. Because remember what we're really talking about here is preserving genes. So I think you would probably say, okay, you would do the various forms of cloning that you do with any other endangered species to uh, be sure that there's plenty of genetic variety in what's left of the Bushmen, that uh, they are capable of expanding their range and their viability, and a lot of the technique of doing that, we now know, is genetic. Some of it would be what you would call cloning human beings. You might even take, for example, uh, if they're if you were, if they'd been outbreeding a lot and you were down to relatively few, quote, pure Bushmen, uh, you might really want to have some of those pure genomes to draw from in clone form. Um, I, I, there's a book I'm going to recommend that you don't get to read until October because it doesn't come out called Regenesis by George Church and Ed Regis. And I'll just quote. Uh, a woman who's head of the Audubon Center for Research on Endangered Species near New Orleans, Betsy Desser. And she says about cloning, and think about this in terms of humans that we might care about. Cloning can help eliminate disease in a population by cloning only the disease-free animals. Cloning versus saving habitat is a false choice. You do both. Cloning members of an endangered species can help preserve and propagate species that reproduce poorly in captivity. This is the, the captive breeding problem. Clothing, cloning can introduce new genes back into the gene pool of species that have few remaining members. This is where you might want to draw on, on uh, the frozen viable cells. And clones of healthy animals can be introduced into wild populations to give a, quote, booster shot to a species undergoing a loss of genetic diversity. Which is what happened to the peregrine falcon. Right. Which actually has already been done with the peregrine falcon. The Midwestern peregrine falcon, the one that we have now, has gone through this process. And uh, we're pretty happy with it. Let me open it up. If this didn't sp uh, spawn a few questions. It, uh, Raise yes, a few eyebrows. Uh, way in the back, since the back was, uh, doesn't use a guess, with a baseball hat on. Hi, thank you for being here. I'm Donna Casey, I'm an internal medicine physician from Dallas. I think all this technology is fabulous for what it's gonna do for humans, but um, I'm wondering how this is being funded. How are you guys paying for this? And then um, what I see happening in the future is people like me are gonna say, you know, I've got a whisker from my cat and I want to reproduce him. Seriously, can't, can't you see that happening? But more importantly, right. how, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I, by the way, I'm not gonna give you my cat's whisker, but some little old lady is gonna say, I'll spend an inordinate amount of money to clone my cat. But really, how are you funding this now? Sure, I wanna be really clear about this. We're not the primary funders of any of this. So there are already endeavors all over. I mentioned projects out of Korea, uh, projects in Australia, places all over the US where they're working on individual species out of individual labs. Um, Stuart and I have just personally gotten interested in this and started raising the question, well, what about that passenger pigeon? It turned out there were a lot of people working on parts of it, and so we're trying to help infuse a little bit of grad student work this summer. So that's kind of our financial commitment to it. So in terms of people actually doing the de-extinction work, uh, they're all independently funded. Um, and you're absolutely right about cloning. Uh, I remember five years ago, a company was started in Sausalito, where we happened to live, that was, uh, trying to bring back your favorite pet. And it came and went in a real flash. So, you know, I, whether the market will be there someday, I don't know, but um, clearly people are, will do anything for their pets. One of the things that, that might occur that I'd like to see is, you know, what extinct species would you like to see come back? Um, there's the ivory-billed woodpecker, that people are trying to see if there's any left out there in the woods. Um, Sylvia, yours was the uh, Caribbean monk seal. Ed, Ed Wilson, what species do you want back? 
Imperial Woodpecker of Mexico. That's interesting. That's very close to the ivory bill. Um, there's the heath hen. There's the Labrador duck. Uh, there's the dodo. The dodo, it turns out, was a pigeon. Big pigeon. There's, uh, the, there's the, the various flightless animals that, that were really charismatic. The great auk, this beautiful clown-looking large bird. There was a New Zealand giant moa, which is as tall as two of us. Uh, they got good eggs from those things. And uh, so the, the idea of being able to think about, well, how about plants? Frankly, nobody has told us about a plant that wants to come back. Uh, we asked an uh, uh, entomologist uh, we know, um, extract uh, Nomi Pierce at Harvard, uh, what would you like back? And she said instantly, the Xerxes butterfly. Turns out there's this blue butterfly that was in California. There's specimens of it. Uh, it was revered, now it's gone. But we have good specimens. Things might be able to come back. So I think there's going to be a period of years of thinking through not so much the commercial aspects or entirely even the funding aspects. So I think some people will adopt a species and want to put some of their personal money into a project to help not only bring it back, but more importantly to me, bring back the habitat that it wants to live in. So say so about climate change, Stuart, because it's very relevant to this topic, because we haven't really spoken about that. Well, here we are at the, uh, you know, dealing with the, the new reality. Uh, climate change is among us. And climate change is doing, among other things, putting species that are not so much in danger of extinction, newly in danger of extinction. So we need to know a lot more about how to prevent extinction. It has put some national parks in the interesting situation of the species that they were busily keeping out as invasive species coming up from the south <laughs> uh, because the basically the, the everything's getting warmer, they've now got to welcome these species coming up from the south who need a place to roost because they won't be able to live where they were further south from there. So all the, the flux that is being brought on by climate change and sea level, acid, acidification and so on of the oceans, all of this is going to affect probably in a, in a bad way um, loss of biodiversity. And it is also going to mean that a lot of weedy species, a lot of opportunistic species, are going to take off. And we're going to be going through various debates about, well, we've always hated them because they were so weedy and our endem endemics are so precious, but they're so damn precious that you have to coddle them to keep them. And under climate change situations, can you do that? So there's all of the standard ideas that we've developed in the, in the last three decades about extinction are in flux and a wonderful book. I'll make another book a recommendation. This one's available. It's called Nature's Ghosts by Mark Barrow, Jr. Um, this book is a history of the idea of extinction, a history of the concern about extinction. And people in this room are now in the process of helping write the next chapter for this book. It was only 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson didn't believe extinction existed. It was not thought to, it was, you know, the Bible made very clear. You created creatures, but it didn't say anything about extinguishing them. So it was assumed that they all lasted forever. And maybe some were gone locally, but there must be some somewhere. And so it was basically getting to Darwin that the realization came that extinction was possible. And it's why we want to focus on the passenger pigeon, uh, because that was the breakthrough realization. That this totally abundant bird could go not only down to just a few, but actually to zero was horrific. Sylvia, actually. Oh, Sylvia. Uh, you get the right of uh, <laughs> Duarte, Duarte Sylvia. <laughs> so you've already alluded to this in part, talking about the condor, mm -hmm. that when they're raised under captive circumstances, they don't know how to be condors if they don't have the right guidance from wild parents. They okay. figure it out, but it's harder. Yeah, well, I've heard many. They, they need to be raised like Ed Wilson wants ch our children to Turn be Turn them raised. loose, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wondered what your thoughts are with case by case, I suppose. But with a passenger pigeon, for example, 
one passenger pigeon doesn't make a passenger pigeon society, if you will. And even when there are a thousand of them, they are probably effectively extinct because it takes a lot of passenger pigeons to make passenger pigeons. I mean, they are so social in their structure. And it, you know, that when they got down to a dozen, they were gone. Mm -hmm. The last two, they were already well long gone. Recovering back to a critical mass, and engaging them in the process of how do you be a passenger pigeon or a monk seal or anything. Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, uh, Ryan, do you want to? Well, this is one of the most exciting aspects, I think, of this whole endeavor is uh, really understanding that behavior because you could make it phenotypically look like a passenger pigeon pretty easily, but can you create the actual behavior of the passenger pigeon is what you're asking. And this is yeah. right and how much is learned. And this is where, where George Church, the genomic engineer that Stuart was talking about, gets so excited because he really believes that once we start looking trait by trait at the behavior of these birds, and over time, or any species, that we're gonna learn incredible things about the science, because we don't know. Is it because the, there's a, another bird in the wild doing this with that you know, offspring, or is it something much more um, hardwired in the genome and we just don't know how to tweak it? So uh, the reason sociobiology was so controversial at the time was that Ed Wilson was basically saying there's a lot more nature and a lot less nurture in these creatures, including us, than we thought. And uh, our question is, is how far does that actually go? And in some species, there may be a whole lot of nurture involved. In other species, maybe not so much. And then just having the genes is enough. You know, is the genome the species? This is a question. And the answer, I think, will emerge. But by the way, there's another level of ethical consideration here, which is raised by uh, one of our friends, a biologist working in Hawaii. Uh, what's the sort of iconic uh, extinct bird there? The OO or something like that? Anyway, there's an icon. There's a lot of extinct birds in Hawaii, but there's one that everybody loves most of all. And uh, this was Richard, Pyle. Rich Pyle. Rich Pyle, you know. Rich Pyle said, well, if you're gonna bring back the OO, or whoever it is, um, while you're at it, would you make them uh, uh, resistant to avian flu? There is already work going on at the Rosalind Institute in Scotland to make chickens resistant to avian flu, which we would be glad of because that's a domestic animal. You don't want to have going down that exposed to avian flu and then spreading it around all the other birds, including the, the wild birds. So is it okay to do that? Is it okay to tweak, you know, since you're in there tweaking anyhow, and we're already tweaking humans not to get mitochondrial diseases, is it okay to tweak a, a about to be formally extinct creature or plant uh, with a little bit of an improvement. Mm -hmm. That's not been well answered. Let, let, let us open it up. <laughs> uh, back there, uh, wherever. Back there, yeah, the two on the aisle. We'll get both of you to you. Okay, thank you. Interesting <laughs> discussion. I've got, wanted to raise two issues. So if you're bringing a, a species back from extinction, it seems to me the, one of the characteristics of a viable species is genetic diversity within that species. So cloning one or two doesn't nearly give you that genetic diversity. Right. So my, my first question is that. The other let, let, me, let me hold you to that one question right now because there's like 100 <laughs> hands and that's a great question. Well, number one, many of these species have multiple, multiple specimens from all over a particular numbers of regions. So you could get incredible diversity. And in fact, as Stuart mentioned, we could potentially help the e extant cheetah today, the living cheetah today, by helping introduce some old DNA into the, into the germ mm -hmm. lines. So there's, there's about 2,000 um, passenger pigeon specimens scattered around the various museums and people's desktops and so on. We have the Carolina parakeet, another much loved bird that went extinct that Audubon made a beautiful painting of. Um, there's 800 specimens of the Carolina parakeet. They will have an enormous variety and you, so you want to work from those to get the variety into your initial population. And th this is what captive breeding is all about, is, is often taking a species like the California condor or tigers that are going through a genetic bottleneck to uh, expand the, the genetic range that they're working with. Right on the aisle with the microphone, and then, yeah, we'll, 
Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, John Foley, the University of Minnesota. Uh, I think this is really brilliant and really exciting, but I'd encourage you to think a little bigger and longer term, strangely enough. I mean, we're facing um, not just a loss of individual species, I and mean, we're going to see the unraveling of entire sections of the biosphere. Uh, the tropical rainforest, tropical corals, tundra ecosystems, not just individual species. I mean, we can put a bunch of species together, and it's not an ecosystem, it's a zoo. Uh, they're not the same thing. So how will your successors, let's say 50, 100, 200 years from now, we're gonna be charged with you know, rebuilding these entire ecosystems. What do we need to do today to make sure they have an easier job at doing that? This has been the use of iconic endangered species for quite a while to bring back habitat. And so Ed talked about uh, getting the wildlife corridor going from Louisiana north. Uh, that's starting to get into the territory where the passenger pigeon, which had an enormous range, basically almost from the Mississippi to the Atlantic, and almost from the Gulf to Canada, and actually some ways into Canada. The, the chestnut has to be brought back, the American chestnut, and biotech is helping that, by the way. And that is well along. The American Chestnut Foundation is a wonderful organization. We're supporting, if you're in the east, plant some trees. Uh, likewise, the oaks are a bit in trouble. They need help. The beech nut, which is the major food of the passenger pigeon, uh, needs help. And so I think that some of these extinct, potentially de-extinctable species can be used as, as flagships, as, as icons for bring back, you know, build the wild wave, build the wildlife corridor. Be sure that this particular species that we care about so much in relation to coral reefs, it, it's not going to be worth bringing back if there's not coral reefs for it to flourish in. And so these things go together if you do it right. They don't go together if you do it wrong. Yeah, a woman right here. So. Hi. Um, thank you. Right. I'm going to take this back a little bit. Um, you mentioned that a lot of hippies may have been Luddites in their rejection of technology as a tool. However, I think it's useful to look at it in terms of it was an analysis of power relations. So, for example, with human genetic engineering and the potential it has today, we cannot assume that it will remain in the hands of the benign. So the notion of super soldiers and selective uh, selection of human beings for power and corruption. As we know, we don't live in a perfect world and human nature is not infinitely trustable in all cases. <laughs> How do you feel about the potential and what is the level of debate and discussion ethically of the scientists who are at the very beginnings of this and where it could go? Well, what's really exciting, um, with National Geographic, we're going to be doing a, a gathering of, of a private invitational workshop with the scientists that are working in this field to actually start to flag these ethical challenges. And we're hoping to do in the spring a much bigger public forum to invite, obviously, public discussion about these big, big issues and the unintended consequences of these things. So I think the, the debate about this is just starting to come out. I mean, um, I haven't gone to too many conferences where I've ever heard this discussed before, and I don't know if you guys have, but um, I think you're going to start to see more and more of this in the press, and I think part of what we want to make sure is that we don't get, that this emerging field doesn't get um, constrained by the uh, knee-jerk knee <laughs> reaction <laughs> of we've got to stop this before it gets out of, out of the gate. I don't think you can stop it, and I think what we can do is make sure it's done as responsibly as possible. But I'm not trying to punt on the fact that it, you know, there will be unintended consequences of everything. The question is, how well are you monitoring it, and what systems do you have in place to, to uh, guide it? One of the things that's impressed me about the synthetic biologists uh, is they involve bioethicists and people concerned with social, cultural, and legal issues every step of the way. Uh, I was once told by a bioethicist, the one thing you don't do is surprise a bioethicist because the answer is always no. Uh, what you want is your bioethicist familiar with the technology, familiar with the situation. They bring their familiarity with cultural mores, with the senses morality. Uh, we're going to need a whole lot of sense of what is ecologically responsible uh, 
what is the ecologically responsible way to think about this whole process? Um, and th the advantage is that we're here actually to start this discussion. We're not here to report, oh, by the way, we've just released uh, a thousand passenger pigeons in Missouri, uh, get used to it. <laughs> That's not the way it's working. It would work that way if we don't go through this discussion and think about it, think of the uh, potential benefits. Uh, imagine that as with every new technology, there's not only unintended consequences that you don't like, there's always unintended benefits. We will not know what those are. And so you, you'd start what I call a vigilance principle. It's the match to the precautionary principle, which is, yeah, you're cautious and you're vigilant. And, and your caution tells you what to be vigilant about. And these ethical issues, ecological issues, cost issues, you know, is this a trade-off for something that we value more, things like that. That's what you set in motion early on in the process so that everybody who's doing the technical breakthroughs, who may or may not be ecologists, who may or may not be people who are concerned with conservation at all, or with society at all, they're, you know, they're taking their amazing technology and seeing what cool thing they can do with it, so that that context is present for them from the start. And that uh, looks like how it's proceeding. I think I understood at the beginning you were saying that you um, that GMOs are a good thing, and and then I'm hearing now you're speaking that saying endangered species is a, a problem, and GMOs lead to endangered species. So that's just a comment I would love to hear your reaction to. And then the question is, you um, you asked the question of well, what species would you want us to, you know, of the crowd, what species would we want to bring back? And I would ask you is how do we determine what we want versus what we need? Do we really need these species back? What are, how are they going to fit into an ecosystem? Or we just like iconic, beautiful um, megafauna or you know, these iconic species. So that's my question. Um, we talk about it and we negotiate. <laughs> uh, that's how these things get sorted out. And uh, I think the more people in the conversation, the better. The, the longer term, so you get a chance to work through I mean, every one of us hears about a new subject, uh, our, our knee jerks, whatever it is, mine sure does. And you want to get through the first three levels of knee jerk response, uh, take the time to do that, get the, he does see it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, get down to the numbers, get down to the basics, get down to the actual reality of the technology. We're not talking about Frankenstein. Frankenstein was a, a, a wonderful fiction story. And, uh, However, whatever the cool things we do with humans, we're not going to sew together their pieces. And that one goes walking around the landscape. Doesn't work that way. We have zombies instead. <laughs> and vampires. <laughs> right here. <laughs> uh, the mic is right behind you. Bill Blakemore with ABC News. I'd like to ask for a reality check. We've been hearing about the six extinctions for some time with estimates from Ned Wilson, Tom Lovejoy, many, many of you uh, in, the, in the tens of thousands of species already going extinct all the time and maybe 20 to 50 percent of species on Earth extinct or committed to extinction in the second half of this century. That's a big number. Now, it's exciting to hear about that you can't stop this and that there are hundreds of uh, specimens of um, some of the species we know about that people care about, like the passenger pigeon. But, if, but my guess is that there's not a lot of specimens of many in fact, only a tiny fraction of those tens of thousands that are going extinct. So just to be clear, you're not exactly saying that this is, although it could give the public the false impression that this may bring the sixth extinction to an end, you're not talking about anything about ending the sixth extinction at all, are you? We're just saying there's another category of extinction. You know, the red list uh, shows certain creatures as extinct in the wild meaning they're only in, in zoos and in captive breeding situation or in botanical gardens. And then there's extinct. Well, there's another layer of extinct, which is uh, a, a species of which there is no um, DNA left in the world. That's extinct. That, that's that's when extinct. it's really gone. <laughs> You're not going to bring back a species <laughs> whose DNA is gone from the world uh, you know, unless you, you know, just invent something like it and then you're, you can imagine that happening. They do it in Hollywood all the time. 
Um, but in terms of the, this is what just happened, is a, an another degree of extinction. But here's what's going to happen. I think th there were, uh, one of the first knee-jerk things, the first question we get all the time, I'm impressed with this group, you didn't ask it, but others do. But won't this mean that people will just be casual about endangered species and not try to protect them anymore? Because, oh, well, hell, if it goes extinct, that's right, we got some tissue, we'll just bring it back. Yeah, well, uh, the cost, expense, uh, difficulty, and possibly impossibility of bringing back things uh, species who's gone through this membrane of there being no living extant organisms left, you've suddenly gone up a hundredfold in cost and difficulty and probably down to a tenth of the probability of getting back the species in the first place. And the, the other byproduct is if you go through this, trying to get it back through the membrane, you learn a lot about what caused these species to go through the membrane into extinction uh, in the first place. So there's a complete continuity rather than a choice between protecting endangered species and bringing back extinct species. It's all one subject. Yeah, on the aisle there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to bring this back to a kind of another layer that's implicit in all this, not the specifics of bringing back endangered species, but the challenge to have an ethical structure with which to cope with this. And I think that's the larger question. I, earlier on, there was a discussion about, you know, the moral structure of the Baptists as they moved west across the United States. Uh, what we seem to be confronting over and over again, whether it's with uh, nuclear power, and you know that's the Frankenstein genie in the bottle, as and, and many people would love to just have it go away, and never recognize it's. They have to love climate change. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, there's you know there's the hidden, the unintended benefit as opposed to the unintended consequence. But what this really raises for me, and what it seems to be you're be challenging everybody to, is we need to evolve more sophisticated ethical structures to cope with the questions that science bring us. And to a certain degree, religious fundamentalism across the planet is a, w is a, is a retreat from that challenge, just in the way that the, ba you know, the, 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 the fundamentalists want to define life at conception, or in the, the end of days, in effect, is a moral structure to cope with the idea of nuclear holocaust. Uh, we don't right. have the ethical structures to deal with these questions. You want to well, do it, Ryan? I would just say we couldn't agree with you more. And um, I think there have been some, we can look to history for some of these. And this certainly came up in the early days of DNA work. Um, and, it, and I think that what we're hoping is that th this workshop that we will be having will be the beginning of that dialogue. And um, to our knowledge, nothing like that has happened Ryan, before. Ryan, do you want to say a little bit of what you went through working with human genetic knowledge, where the, some of the bioethicists, the discussion there was uh, you can't trust people with knowledge about their own genome? I think that's too complicated, yeah. actually, for, for this. It's too off track. But, you know, basically, in a nutshell, uh, helping people obtain information about their own genetic makeup has been my field for the last five years. And when I started it in 2005, it was hugely controversial that this was something that physicians should have, it should be kept in safeguard, and maybe with some people you could share it with patients. And then, you know, it was pretty it draconian. It was privacy debates, and then, uh, you know, then there's people who would like to get their genome out there for everybody. And in five years, <laughs> that has, well, I would say more like eight years now, that has really changed. I mean, there is the Personal Genome Project, and there are open public access databases and clinical trials, and it has just m changed so fundamentally. But in those early days, that paranoia, um, you know, was a major barrier for patients getting access to the medical care that they should have had. Uh, th th the core of this question, though, is could advances in technology outstrip a moral capacity to have an architect before them? Has that ever happened in history, Stuart? I would say no. Um, you, know, you, you go to various instances of, of things which had, you know, the Industrial Revolution. Um, the creation of the loom? I mean, the automobile. Had, you know, there was a Dickensian side to what happened in cities, what happened in factories, and it got sorted out. Um, and 
generally it was eventually good news. Agriculture uh, was probably really deeply hated by the hunting and gathering folks um, because it put them out of business. And it happens everywhere it goes on. Um, some interesting things come out of these discussions. I am not usually a big supporter of, of PETA because uh, it makes it hard, they often make it hard to do decent science with lab animals. But on the other hand, PETA is the outfit that came up with a million dollar prize, which I think is being decided the first round this month, uh, for vat grown meat. Well, from their standpoint, they, they do not want uh, cattle being grown in order to be killed and, and suffer. Uh, suffer from their death and suffer from a not so pleasant life. And if you could get vat grown meat that's as good as a T bone steak, uh, they say there's the workaround. Mm -hmm. That's their standpoint. My standpoint is something like 20 to 30 percent of the ice free land in the world is given over to grazing instead of rainforest, like it should be. And uh, the most harmful thing that humans do to the landscape really is agriculture, and the largest part of that is for grazing animals. So if you can now suddenly say that there's no more reason to be cutting down rainforest in Brazil for these cows because we can grow better meat in vats, right on PETA. And so you know, one moral set of considerations when it goes well can then play over into my standpoint an environmentally moral ethical set of considerations where uh, it's a win-win-win deal. And in this case, biotech is the medium by which everybody wins, uh, unless there's a whole lot of cows who want to come into existence and then be killed, mm -hmm. which may, you know, we haven't asked them. Yes, you have your hand up as more eagerly than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, things like Moore's Law and Kurzweil Law predict this exponential you know, curve in the advancement of technology. So I mean, pretty soon our, you know, ethical judgments might be outstripped by, you know, new technological advancements. And there are, I mean, pretty significant amateur synthetic biology uh, societies and cities. So what happens in 50 years when, you know, there's public technology available for, you know, all of these tricky ethical situations? I mean, how would you control that? Does Moore's law apply to moralists? <laughs> the Ryan and I organized events. And back in the day in 1983-84, we organized an event called the Hackers Conference, uh, which was bringing together of the uh, outlaw computer hackers. Uh, there were three generations of them at that time who had never actually met each other. And we brought them together and, and uh, the world changed. Uh, Steve Wozniak was at that one. And at that time, the FBI knew only one thing about hackers, which is that they were a, a, a menace. And in fact, someone put in jail just for being hackers. Um, and the ignorance on the, F on the FBI side of what was actually going on with code at that time, and by the way, there's a lot of overlap here between computer code and genetic code. Those two codes are colliding in this decade, and it's going to be, you know, there's biohackers coming along, as you suggest. Well, it's interesting that the major collection of biohackers is every September at MIT, uh, the so-called iGEM Jamboree, uh, International Genetic Engineered Machine Gatherings. And these are undergraduate teams which over the summer, summer invent new organisms, mostly variations on E. coli, that can do astounding things, I mean, really wonderful things. They start out being kind of frivolous things, and pretty soon they were curing AIDS and doing all sorts of stuff with these uh, rejiggered organisms. And um, there's an FBI guy who shows up every year, sort of in costume, not his costume, their costume, uh, with uh, on his nameplate it says FBI Weapons of Mass Destruction, and then this guy's name, Bill, or whatever it is. And he's basically going around saying, hi, I'm Bill. Um, I'm here to help. And that's the difference that happened between the Hackers Conference then and the IGM meetings now is that people like the FBI or the military and so on are realizing that amateur is where a lot of this stuff comes from. And that's good. And amateur is where the that's your sensor network. 
these are the people who know what's going on out there. The outlaws know about the, what the other outlaws are doing. It's really pre-laws. There isn't a law yet about what they're doing. And they're pre-commercial, they're pre-law, they're doing stuff. They're aware of what's hazardous. They're aware of what's spooky. They don't want their hobby, their exciting field, their future uh, discipline to get screwed up by some jerk doing something stupidly dangerous out of either ignorance or malevolence. And so they are, the FBI is realizing, these other guys are realizing, that's your network and they all are network. So instead of assuming potential for harm, assume potential for really, really good grassroots vigilance and grassroots ethics. If you build on that, then you can probably work out okay. Stuart Brand, Ryan Phelan, thank you all very much. Thank you all. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Okay, everyone's uh, invited over to the reception. It's across Anderson Park at our door hosier, and that starts right now. So if you need a cart, there will be carts out here. If you're kind of tired, your knees from knee jerking or, and need a help, uh, you'll have help getting over there. Stuart and uh, Dr. Will